So this is uh, Freedom for Animals' first ever wildlife webinar. Um, I'm Sam Thedgill, the director here at Freedom for Animals. We've also got Nicola, our fundraising and communications manager. We've got uh, Dr. Luke Blaszczewski, who's a photographer and filmmaker um, whose work kind of works to empower people to engage with nature and to, to explore the natural round natural world around us. And we've got Jack Wotton, who's an aquatic ecologist uh, and documentary maker. Uh, and his speciality is the conservation of the critically endangered European eel, amongst many other things. So really looking forward to, to hearing what they've got to say. Now, as you everyone, I'm assuming, knows that this is the first day that kind of lockdown restrictions have been eased just slightly. And uh, we all know what it means uh, to be in the really difficult situation of being uh, confined to a home for, for quite a few number of weeks now. But this is the reality of animals in zoos and in aquaria every single day. And we know that it's for our own collective uh, benefit that we're helping to suppress this virus and that there's reasons why we have these constraints within our lives. But there are no reasons for those same similar constraints we put on uh, zoo animals and aquarium animals on their lives and they don't know why they're in there is the thing and this is why um, campaigning against zoos and aquaria is one of freedom for animals um, is at the heart of what we do um, because this uh, this lockdown situation that these animals face day in day out causes massive stress to the animals and something called uh, zoocosis, which is this mental uh, mental illness caused by um, highly unnatural environments and these really uh, small enclosures that bear no resemblance to, to what their life is like out in the wild. For example, uh, in September last year, uh, we went undercover at Borth Wild Animal Kingdom near Aberystwyth in Wales, and we filmed this serval, who's an African wildcat, named Indu, and we found that her enclosure was 0.0001% of what her natural home range would be in the wild. And we filmed her pacing up and down in her tiny enclosure and driven mad by, by this lockdown life. So that's what happens uh, in zoos and aquaria. And what uh, the main thing that they, the, the industry uh, kind of promotes itself on is education to the public, education, uh, that children and adults can come to these places and connect with nature. They can see animals um, from all across the globe. But how much is this truly an educational experience, seeing these, uh, these animals highly distressed in highly unnatural environments, when nature is all around us and there's plenty of animals that we can see, whether we live in a city, whether we live in a rural landscape, wherever, there's plenty uh, of nature that we can connect with in a much more meaningful uh, and a much more ethical way. So that's uh, that's enough for me talking about this uh, this kind of the positives that we can we can do and how we can reconnect with uh, animals all around us. Um, starting up, we've got Luke Blaze Juski, uh, who will be talking about. Um, the animals within your local area and how to reconnect uh, with nature in your area. So over to you, Luke. Hi, thanks, Sam. And good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, as Sam just sort of touched on, I really want to talk tonight about our relationship with the natural world. And to do that, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories from my own experience, really, sort of from the time I first came up to Manchester, which is about 10 or 12 years ago. And the sort of the thread that has pulled me through all of this in relation to how it's changed the way that I see nature. Um, so I've called the talk keep off the grass. Um, and I remember the moment, the, the first time I saw one of these signs in a local park, and I thought that really hits the nail on the head. That really summarizes the disconnect that we have between people and the natural world, particularly in this country and particularly in cities. Um, and since then, that sort of term has continued to sort of resonate with me a little bit. And I'm hoping to take you through a little bit of my thinking around this um, tonight. 
So um, as Sam kindly said in the introduction, um, I'm a wildlife filmmaker photographer and um, I specialize in films that explore people's relationships with the natural world. Those are the stories that I'm particularly interested in telling. Um, this is a, this was me um, making a film about mountain hares at Dovestones Reservoir not so long ago. Um, so I'm interested in those sort of relationships and this really came from sort of my early days as a photographer really. When I first came to Manchester I started spending a lot of time with the local wildlife. Um, I was particularly interested in those sort of common everyday overlooked forgotten ignored species. Um, and I used photography to try and show them in a slightly different light, um, show them in a slightly different way with the aim, really, that the next time the person sees the photograph and then sees that animal out in the world, maybe they'll start thinking differently. I think we have um, a disconnect with between sort of our, ourselves and the natural world um, today. And, I, and it comes from a very complex set of circumstances and situations that have ran sort of maybe throughout the last 200 years, which I'll sort of try and touch on a little bit. Um, so this is where my story begins, really. This is the River Irwell in Salford, Lower Broughton. Um, it's half a mile from Manchester city centre. It's by the University of Salford campus, and it's a very urban environment. Uh, when I came here about 12 years ago, the first thing I did is I started walking along the riverbanks with my camera and I was amazed at how much wildlife I could find. Um, and I spent loads of time there, photographing the birds, the butterflies, the wildflowers, really sort of um, taken back from, uh, taken back by the amount of diversity on my doorstep. I originally come from the black country, the West Midlands, a little town near Dudley. Um, and it shares a lot in common with Salford in the sense that they're sort of post-industrial, typically working class sort of towns that have changed a lot since the Industrial Revolution. Um, they're led by sort of rivers and canals, but the sort of difference really when I came up to Salford was that I was noticing all this wildlife on the doorstep it, to, to a degree that I never really noticed when I was at home. So I was excited about this and I spent a lot of time photographing it and I started talking to people who were you know, around Salford, living in Salford, from Salford. And I was saying, you know, isn't the Irwell amazing? Like the River Irwell, like it's this incredible thing. Like, why is nobody, why aren't more people there? Like, it's a beautiful space. There's so much going on. And I, I started getting these funny looks from people. Um, and it took me a long time to realize that not everyone shared my passion for this river. And I did a little bit of digging as to why that might be. And of course, I stumbled upon um, a little bit of local history uh, around Salford and Manchester and also sort of almost unexpectedly stumbled on what I think is maybe one of the, the greatest sort of untold conservation stories in the UK. Um, so for those of you who know Salford or Manchester area, um, this is the Crescent Road. Uh, it's a painting that was made about 200 years ago um, during the Industrial Revolution by a Victorian painter and it's an area of Salford, again, in Lower Broughton, called the Crescent Road. And that's this road sort of in the bottom left. You can see these people in their fine garbs heading um, down the road into Manchester city centre. The building on the top left of the hill is a place called Lark Hill Estate. And that stood there for many years, but it's now the site of the University of Salford. And this sort of bank coming down from that big pink hill is uh, Peel Park. Um, Today it's Peel Park. So you can see that, you know, not that long ago, really, this area in Salford was quite a rural, quite an idyllic, picturesque landscape. Um, but of course, as we know the history of Manchester and Salford, this area didn't stay like this forever. Um, this is one of the images that maybe a lot of people associate Manchester with more often. This is the, um, again, the Irwell in Manchester city centre during the Industrial Revolution. You've got the cathedral, Manchester Cathedral in the background, and you can already see the chimneys coming up, the buildings coming up around the river. And before you know it, this is kind of the, the state of affairs that we were dealing with. You've got the chimneys in the sky pumping out all this smoke. You've got the factories, you've got the buildings. You can notice that all the architecture, all of the, all of the houses built up alongside the river, facing away from the river. There's no 
public access points there's no footpaths there's no cycleways you know there's no trees there's no wildflowers there's no fish in the water there's no birds along the sides of the banks um, and the reason for this is because the river became incredibly polluted um, factories would often throw all of their chemicals after a day's work out of the back straight into the river and this went on for decades um, there's old anecdotes about you used to be able to know what day of the week it was by what color the river was because every day dye, dye factories would put a different color dye into the river after a day of production um, and as i said we had no um, fish no birds it, it was very much um, a lifeless landscape uh, and it stayed like that for a very long time up until about the 1980s really the late 70s 1980s when there was a huge conservation sort of cleaning up effort around the um, the river where the water quality improved slowly but surely we saw fish coming back birds coming back the soil and the nutrients in the ground started recovering wildflowers started taking root pollinators started coming back color to the landscape started to appear again um, and today the Irwell is a very different place to what it was uh, we've got all kinds of wildlife along its banks now. The reason why I tell this story is not only to sort of set the scene really for that industrial context and how Salford and Manchester have changed over the years, but it's also a story that sort of upset me greatly when I first discovered it because, you know, here we have the River Irwell. The reason, you know, the, 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 almost the single reason as to why Manchester was allowed or able to trade with the world, you know, without access to the Irwell and then the ship canal and then the ocean, Manchester would not have been able to become as, in, as international and as global a city as it was able to do with its um, importation and exportation of all the goods during the Industrial Revolution. So Manchester took the river, it used it and it abused it and it got everything that it could possibly get out of it to make money. And then when, just after the war, when the um, Industrial Revolution was tailing off and globalization was coming from all these different angles the river stopped becoming such an important resource for the city and so it just left it and it just left it to die um, and I find that story quite upsetting because you know the river gave it gave the city everything that we have today but as soon as it not as soon as it stopped being useful the city turned its back on it luckily for us um, as I said, the, the, the Irwell went through a huge cleaning up process in the 70s and the 80s. And today we've got all these wonderful different creatures that call it home. Uh, we've got the kingfisher, which I think is maybe one of the most recognisable birds in um, the UK. Maybe the, the, the most recognisable bird for people who have never seen the bird before, if you know what I mean. Because it's just so recognisable from children's books or, you know, covers of identification books. Everybody knows a kingfisher even though most of our experiences are very fleeting. Um, we've got incredible migrants that come to Salford in the winter. We have uh, sometimes have flocks of waxwing that come over from Scandinavia when the winters are particularly harsh and they come over to feed on what's left of our berry and fruit trees. Um, there was an incredible flock that came over or an incredible migration of the birds about four years ago. Um, and it's one of the weirdest sort of bird watching experiences of my life, really, because, you know, you go bird watching, you go to these beautiful locations, you go to the ocean, the mountains, the forests. I photographed this in an industrial estate in Salford on New Year's Day, um, surrounded by about 15 lorries just sort of moving around and beeping. Um, but I knew the birds were there from a couple of colleagues. And uh, I went early on New Year's Day thinking, I'll just go and see it, get some shots. And I came around the corner in this incredibly unattractive industrial estate. And there was, a, there, was a, there was a group of about 40 bird watchers just there, just about half past seven on New Year's Day, looking at these birds. So you never know where you're going to find something special. And I'll come back to that as a theme in a moment. Um, cormorants, um, signs of cormorants are, you know, wonderful, um, typically coastal birds that are becoming more um, prevalent in cities as our waterways clean up, lovely birds to see, um, the absolute enemy of fishermen all over the country, but uh, an example really of waterways cleaning up around, you know, our rivers are getting cleaner, our canals are getting cleaner, the fish are coming back, 
and the birds that feed on fish are subsequently coming back. So having cormorants are a great example of water quality. And of course, the river's home to new life every spring as well. Um, at around about this time, uh, this time this year, you know, hopefully we'll start seeing some new arrivals to our sort of rivers and um, canals all over the country. Um, but I want to sort of build on this idea of biodiversity really in the cities and, and not knowing what you'll discover until you go out there. This is a stretch of the River Irwell, again in Lower Broughton, East Salford, very industrial, um, very urban, half a mile from Manchester city centre. It's a stretch of the bank that in the middle of the summer is in full bloom. You can see all these wildflowers. A lot of people might call them weeds, but you know, incredibly rich, diverse um, wildflower habitat. And during um, certain times of the year around Salford, we get all these different kinds of butterflies because of the wildflower habitat we have. So bear with me, I'm going to go on a little bit of an indulgent tour of UK butterflies now, but I promise there's a point to it, so just bear, just bear with me. Um, we have butterflies like the common blue, which is one of my favorites, I think. This, it's only about the size of a penny, but this incredibly exotic, striking blue butterfly that I, you know, I think could come, um, could come straight out of the Amazon, you know, or any tropical environment, really. You know, I think they're incredibly beautiful um, beautiful little butterflies. We've got the common blue. Um, this is the um, this this one is the male. That striking bright blue patterning. And then we also have the female, which uh, has less sort of blue patterning on her wings, but has a really delicate, intricate sort of brown pattern patternation on on the ex on the outside of her wings. Um, we've got um, a relative of this butterfly called the holly blue. Again, only about the size of a penny and lives or spends a lot of its time at the top of trees. Uh, it feeds on um, holly bushes, but throughout a lot of the day, it will just go up to the treetops just to sort of be out of harm's way. Um, quite difficult butterflies to photograph really because they're quite shy, quite skittish. And if you scare them, they'll just fly up to the top of the tree and you probably won't see them for the rest of the day. So this photograph took me a few years to get and I was quite happy uh, when I eventually got it. The holly blue, the beautiful butterflies to see. Um, we've got the comma uh, butterfly, which is the only butterfly we have in this country that doesn't have rounded wings. You can see it's got these wonderful sort of strange shapes to the edges of its wings. It's the only butterfly that doesn't have those rounded wings. Um, and I'm always interested in how animals are named, right? You know, the history of naming animals and, and all of this sort of taxonomical um, sort of heritage to it. Because this butterfly is called the comma, and I was always fascinated by why is it called the comma? Like, look at it, it's, it's fiery and looks like a tiger and the wings are sort of all patterned. And why have they gone with comma uh, of all the things they could have called it? Um, and that's because on the outer side of the wing, which unfortunately you can't see in the photo, there's just very um, sort of plain brown patterning. And just in the middle of that wing, just tiny, just in the middle, there's just a little white dash that vaguely looks like a comma. And for some reason, that's the that's the reason that was enough for <laughs> that was enough for the ecologists of the time to decide that they were going to call this butterfly the comma rather than the funky wing pattern tiger butterfly, which I think would have been a personally a better name. Um, we also have the orange tip butterfly. Now, for a lot of people, I think daffodils and bluebells are the sign of spring arriving. For me, it's the orange tip butterfly. Uh, they're one of the first butterflies that come on the wing around this time in the year. You can find them on the banks of the Mersey and the Irwell. Uh, and when I see them sort of flying around, it's so I always know that the world is waking back up and spring is on its way, which is always really nice to see. And they also have massive eyes as well. Can you see the size of their eyes? Terrifying. Um, we also have uh, the meadow brown, one of the most common butterflies we have in the country and one of the most well named, I think, because they live in meadows and they are brown. So sometimes the, the, the naming sort of structure butterflies does work. Um, very common, um, but beautiful to see and very similar in style to another butterfly that is little and brown called the gatekeeper. Uh, they have similar habitats and they look very similar. They're both very little brown butterflies that live in meadows. Um, and they're very difficult to sort of identify, to separate when you see them both flying nearby. Um, but there's one really easy way of doing it. And you can see on this gatekeeper in the top of its wing, in the, the, there's a black circle, black, black splodge, 
with two little white dots. So that's the gatekeeper. And the easiest way to tell these butterflies apart is if you go back to the meadow brown, you'll see that it's only got one dot in its little black splodge. Um, so that's the easiest way to tell them apart. But again, blows my mind. Like, at, what, at what point did they get around the table and sort of decide, you know, I'll have the two white dots, you have the one white dot, and, and then we'll be able to recognize each other when things get busy. Um, you know, evolution is fascinating in that way, I think. Um, I think we're coming to the end of the butterfly part. So um, thank you for your patience so far. But the peacock butterfly, I think, is one of the most iconic butterflies maybe we've all seen at some point. Um, you can see those eyes, those sort of eye patterns on the edge of the wings that they have. They're big butterflies. And when they open their wings, they sort of almost reveal these two eyes. You know, let's say there's a hungry bird maybe watching this butterfly on a branch, thinking that's gonna be a nice meal. And all of a sudden the peacock will open its wings and you'll see these two big eyes appear on the edge of its wings. And it will um, sort of act as a warning sign to potential predators that maybe that meal isn't going to be as easy as they thought it would. So a very clever sort of defense system. Um, we have the Red Admiral, which is one of the biggest butterflies we have in the country. Very strong, powerful flying butterfly, very aggressive and territorial and will spend its, most of its life just in its little territory, sort of um, flying around, patrolling it throughout the day. Really, really cool butterflies to see. Um, yeah, really, really nice sign of midsummer, really, the, um, the Red Admiral. Uh, and I think last but not least is the brimstone, uh, which, as you can see, is mental. Um, and that, you know, it's kind of like evolved to look like a leaf. Um, this was photographed um, not against the background of a tree, but as soon as they fly off, land on a tree surrounded by leaves, you'll be amazed. They just disappear like that. You know, their camouflage is so incredibly good. Um, and they also take the... Um, they also take the award for potentially being the archetype butterfly because many, many moons ago, before we sort of developed the sort of taxonomical system we have today, today for defining and describing species, this butterfly used to be known locally as the butter colored fly, which legend has it eventually led to the term butterfly. So in many ways, this is the first butterfly. Um, so thank you for bearing with me on that one. I did say that one of the common themes of this talk will be about not, not never knowing what you're going to discover. Uh, I started by saying that, you know, we have this stretch of the River Irwell, this bank of the Irwell that comes into full, full bloom in, in the summer. This bank, everything in this photograph might only be about 50 metres in length of the River Irwell bank. Um, every butterfly that I just listed at some point during the year you can find in this little 50 meter stretch of riverbank in Salford, half a mile from Manchester city center, um, surrounded by some busy roads, lots of houses, um, you know, lots of business going around. And yet we've got all this life just in a very, just in one particular family of species. So again, never know what you're going to find when you um, go around the city. Um, it's been a long time since Market Street in Manchester looked like this, but I always use this, this sort of image as an example, really, of um, our relationship with nature. For me, it works in a very similar way to an, our relationship with each other. Um, I think when you're walking, let's say, down Market Street on a busy day by yourself, there could be a tendency to feel a little bit disconnected, a little bit alone, a little bit sort of um, outside of everything that's going on. And then all of a sudden, there'll just be a face that comes out of the crowd. Um, and all of a sudden this person means something to you, right? And you've got all this hustle and bustle, thousands of people moving past you, but all of a sudden this one person means something. And so why is that? Well, you know their name, you know a little bit about them. You've probably had some experiences together. Um, and all of a sudden this person you can identify and maybe matters to you a little bit more than all of these other people moving past you that you don't really, can't really engage with at the moment. And I think nature works in exactly the same way. You know, if we can, once we start learning a little bit about um, birds or wildflowers or butterflies or whatever it might be, a few names, um, spend a little bit of time in our local parks or our local garden, we start developing these relationships with the natural world. And I'm by no means saying that we need to be ecologists or scientists to do this, definitely the opposite, you know. Um, but there's just a lot of, I think, joy for me, being able to walk through a park and just, you know, recognize a bird or know that 
there's I'm coming up to some wildflowers where at this time of year there's usually a certain kind of butterfly nearby and I can keep an eye out for it you know it just keeps us engaged with the wider world in you know just a, a level that's maybe slightly outside of what we're used to on our sort of every day um and I think it can just be a really lovely thing in general for, for all of our well-being um and there is a serious message in here as well that I thought I'd be remiss not to sort of go over um a few years ago, I was photographing on the banks of the Irwell, and all of a sudden I saw this shape moving out of the corner of my eye. And it turned out to be a can of carling floating on some polystyrene down the river. And it's a bit surreal and a bit sort of funny um, to some degree. But unfortunately, it's um, indicative of a much wider problem um, that we have um, with litter and pollution and waste in general. Um, a couple of years ago, I found a blackbird nest nesting in a windowsill of a building that I was living in. Um, and I was really excited. I thought, great, we're going to have blackbird chicks. Fantastic. Um, and so I kept an eye on the nest over the coming weeks. And just to put this into perspective with blackbirds in the UK, I think there's just over 15 million birds, 15 million blackbirds that we have in the UK and about 5 million of them nest every year. So this is one nest out of potentially 5 million. Um, and as I was looking at the nest over the weeks, I started to notice that something wasn't quite right. And maybe there was something in there that shouldn't have been, as you can see here. Um, and so I took a little bit closer look and I started pulling out these layers of plastic from the blackbird's nest. And before I knew it, this was the amount of plastic that I pulled out of one blackbird nest. Um, and I'm sure you can sort of agree with me in thinking that that's, you know, unfathomable that this much plastic can be in one blackbird nest. And then we start doing the maths, right? We start scaling it up. So there's 5 million nesting blackbirds in the UK. Um, so that's potentially up to 5 million nests that are going to have this problem. But then actually that's only one bird one black you know one species of bird we've also got loads of other species of birds and there's also mammals you know and all of a sudden very quickly we start scaling this problem up um to realize just how you know just to what extent it's got to really um and we've got to ask ourselves a question for the next generation how do we want to be remembered do we want to be remembered as the society that let that lets something as beautiful as the, the cathedral of a swan's nest suddenly start to be built on the grounds, um, uh, the groundwork of plastic bottles and plastic bags, you know. Um, do we want, um, do we want the little mallard ducklings here? Do we want their first days in the world to be navigating plastic bottle tops and cans and takeaway forks in, in the canal or in the river, you know, whatever it might be? Is this the legacy that we want to leave behind? Um, I know what my answer to that is. Um, and it's, it's a difficult one. I think when we talk about the issue of plastic, it's become more onto the agenda recently from the back of planet Earth too, but also from all of the great work that so many conservation and campaign groups have been doing around the country. Um, but we, we're, we're still in many ways talking about it as a problem for the ocean, and it is, it's a really bad problem for the ocean, but it comes from somewhere, you know? Um, it comes from our rivers, it comes from our ship canals, it comes from our cities and it comes from our homes. And so personal choices and behaviour change and thinking from you know, slightly more ethical and compassionate ways does make a difference. And it's very easy to feel sometimes like it might not, but I can assure you that it does. And it's just a message we need to keep hitting home, really. Um, and I'm just going to finish on one lovely story. Um, which happened in Salford in about 1835, I think. Now, I don't know if there's any of you in the audience that recognise this very vague looking landscape, but it's a place called Curzel Moor. It's the only sort of heathland we have in Greater Manchester, I think, before we start getting to the borders of the peaks. This is about two miles from Manchester city centre, maybe three miles. Uh, so it's one of the only sort of inner city heathlands that we have. And on this site, in 1835, there was a young Victorian naturalist called Robert Cribb. Uh, and like a lot of Victorian naturalists, he was absolutely bonkers and spent most of his time wandering around green spaces in Salford and Manchester looking for wildlife um, to identify or collect. And one day he was on Curzel Moor walking around and he found this older tree and he noticed that the older tree was dying. 
And so he went up to the tree and he could see this activity at the base of the tree, at the tree trunk. And so he looked down and he saw all of these moths, just in a group, about 50 moths. Um, and he, he took a closer look and he realized he couldn't recognize them. He couldn't identify them. So as all sort of Victorian naturalists did in those days, when you find an animal that you can't identify, you kill them all and you take them home. And so that's what, that's what he did. He killed all the moths, put them in a bag, went home to identify them. And he couldn't. Um, he spent a few days trying to identify them, totally flummoxed. And so thought, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send three specimens off to the Natural History Museum in London to be identified, uh, which is the practice that you had to do in those days. And that's what he did. Uh, now, in the meantime, he was having a bit of trouble paying his rent uh, and his landlord wasn't very happy. As you can imagine, someone who spent all of his time just killing moths and putting them in bags, he didn't, you know, he, he didn't have a huge amount of money. And so his landlady was saying, you know, need the rent, Robert, I need the rent. Um, and he said, OK, OK, I'm going to get it. You it's all good. I'm going to get you the money. Um, but just so you know, I'm serious about this, you know, as a gesture of good faith, here's a bag of moths. You can just sort of look after that for a, a, a week or two. I'll get the money. You give me the moths back. We're all golden. Problem solved. Um, as you can imagine, she probably wasn't that impressed by this gesture. And she took the moths and just burned them and destroyed them. And they were gone. A couple of weeks later, he got a letter from the London Natural History Museum saying, Dear Robert, thank you for your submission of these three specimens. We'd like it to congratulate you on the discovery of a new species to science. This moth has never been seen before uh, and it's never been recorded. Um, congratulations and thank you for your contribution. He was over the moon. Um, to this day, this moth has never been seen anywhere else in the world. The only records that we have of it are those three species that were recorded by Robert Cribb on Kurzel Moor in 1835. And still to this day, the only specimens we have are the three that are in the Natural History Museum. Um, and this is a bit of an artist's impression of what the moth would have looked like. You can imagine those species are looking a bit worse for wear now, but to this day, never been found um, anywhere else. And so I think that's just a bit of a testament to when we're going, when we're in our gardens, when we're walking around a local park or when we have the freedom to go a little bit further, um, you know, keep your eyes out, keep your ears open. We never know what we're going to find and we never know the sort of um, diversity of life that we have on our doorstep, really. Uh, and that's really the, uh, the point that I wanted to wrap up. And um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks so much, Lou. That was really fascinating, and uh, especially all the amazing animals uh, on the Irwell, right in the middle of Solomon and the industrial estates. That's amazing, yeah, thank you. Um, I must say, if anyone's got any questions for either of our two speakers, uh, please do put them in the chat box, and then at the end, we'll, uh, we'll go through them all and uh, let our two speakers uh, answer all of your queries. Um, so, over to Jack Wooten next. He's, uh, as I said before, an aquatic ecologist, and I'll let him talk to you all about the amazing fish species that live in our rivers, our lakes, and other freshwater areas next to, next to where we live. So Jack, over to you. Okay, uh, first of all, hello everyone. And I will be, yeah, uh, I'll be talking about fish. Um, my greatest delight in life. Um, uh, just to touch on and link with uh, Luke's talk, I think it's, um, I think, yeah, the overarching thing is trying to get people to immerse themselves within, within nature in any way possible. And uh, some of the hardest animals to do this with are the flying species, butterflies, uh, birds have been mentioned, and fish. Um, because they almost live in these different worlds. One is um, able to fly away and reach heights that we can't very, very quickly. Another one uh, is under the water and we can only hold our breath for so long or we have to immerse ourselves within this, in all this different apparatus. And, and that gives us the ability to look at them and be within their world for a small amount of time. But these species I'm speaking about today um, are 
really accessible for everyone. Um, and I've tried to get a mix of different species in there, uh, highlight some of the extraordinary things we have in our freshwater environments and really just give people a chance to um, to appreciate these animals for what they are and realize that um, we have some incredible animals just on our doorstep. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking from, from Edinburgh at the moment, um, but these, these fish are found, um, are found all over the UK. It's, it's not sort of just, uh, just Scottish based. So um, yeah, all fish are wonderful. I, I do genuinely believe that. But in this talk, I'm gonna talk mainly about the, the freshwater and I say sort of here because there's a crossover between some of the species that I'm looking at where they have some of their life in the ocean and they come into uh, freshwater to spawn or vice versa. Uh, all found in the UK, like I said, uh, some are found across Europe and other parts of, uh, parts of the world as well. But um, I'm going to be talking about this in a UK context. Uh, I'm completely biased because I'm a, a freshwater ecologist and uh, this is my 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 realm this is exactly what i i love to speak about um so i'll be probably more enthusiastic than you'll find most people about freshwater fish but that is wrong everyone should be just as excited um so yep uh, i wanted to also focus on freshwater fish because um they get very little attention in comparison to their marine cousins. Uh, we all know about uh, shark species. We all know about these uh, really um, dramatic fish like the, the bluefin tuna, like um, these huge shoals of fish and uh, reefs and all these amazing things which are truly incredible in, in their own right. But we know very, very little about what is just on our doorstep, just in our rivers, our streams, our lakes, uh, our canals. So that's a, another reason. and. Uh, they're very, very accessible. Um, like I said before, with the, their marine cousins, these are maybe less accessible for us. Um, this might be due to the fact that a lot of the things we see on TV are all over the world. Um, and also the fact that our waters are freezing. So sometimes it's not so um, so kind to jump into the water and, uh, and see these species. So some, some facts here anyway. Um, this isn't the, the sort of kindest part of the talk or the nicest part of the talk, but um, these are some really, really interesting and stark figures to show you. Uh, so starting from the left anyway, 1% of the, uh, the world is covered by fresh water. You've got around about 70%, which is marine and uh, or, or the seas. Um, and the majority of the rest is made up by land. But 1%, around 1% actually, just, uh, just shy of it, is made up of fresh water. But 51% of all of the fish species that we know of in the world come from fresh water. So in this 1% that covers the world, 51% of all of the fish species are found within that, which is truly incredible. And we think that that is really driven by the isolation caused by these small pockets of fresh water that has drived things to change, adapt, evolve to the situations that they're in. And these different pressures caused by um, rather extreme changes or rather extreme uh, changes within different pockets of fresh water has driven them to separate into different subspecies and then different species entirely. And this is, this is incredible for the small amount of space that it actually takes up on the world. Um, something that isn't so nice, 30% of the fish species, the freshwater fish species in the world are at risk of extinction. This isn't a, a risk of you know, decline, at risk of threat. This is at, at risk of extinction. This is they are gone, no longer, uh, no longer with us. And in 2020, we lost 80 of our freshwater species. Um, and I think that's that's unbelievably terrifying to lose 80 species from our world that is that is something that isn't acceptable and um is really shocking um then the the last one 35 percent 35 percent of um the freshwater or wetland habitats across the world has been lost in the last 50 years and this is through um the expansion of cities this is through the um Trans, uh, sort of transformation of wetlands into big housing estates. This is a modification of bank sites to narrow them, to control rivers, to stop them flowing and heading out into big swampy uh, lands, which are a perfect habitat for, uh, for wildlife. 
So our control of freshwater environments has reduced it drastically. But we'll stay more positive. And um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the diversity of fish now and some of the incredible things out there. This is obviously a marine picture. And look how amazing it is. I'm going to talk to you about this. <laughs> so this is not... Um, this looks like a, just a bog, um, fairly stagnant water, but behind it is a beaver dam. And uh, I'm not gonna really talk too much about beavers, but I'm gonna focus on the fish. Um, the beavers here have dam dammed up a section and turned it into a boggy marshland. And within this area, there is so much life. I sat here for maybe about two and a half hours, um, just enjoying what was going on in the environment. And there was kingfishers coming down and feeding on small minnows. There was sticklebacks uh, all arguing amongst each other and fighting over territory. There was so much life in just such a small area that is overlooked or even potentially seen as something that's a bit of an eyesore and a bit ugly. Um, so this picture was really just to raise the appreciation of some of our wetland habitats aren't the nicest looking, but they are havens for wildlife. And one interesting and cool thing that I think has um, come up uh, recently in a talk that I heard was that all of the different words for wetlands are negative, uh, like a marsh, a swamp, a bog. None of these are associated with positive things. And I think this is driving the mentality towards people not appreciating these, these habitats, these havens for, for wildlife and, uh, and for fish especially. Uh, so I, I said that I'd speak to you about a few species that are, are really cool, different, that people don't really know about, um, all, in the, all in the UK. These are all species that I've, I've worked with and uh, hold close to my heart. I have every single one of them tattooed on my body as well in different varying life stages, which is odd, but um, this, none of this is particularly normal talk. So the, the sparling, uh, Osmorus epilanus, this, uh, first of all, this fish that is dead in my hand um, is the result of a spawning, a huge mass of spawning coming into a river and the predators coming in and catching them. And there were so many of these fish that they were catching, the heron that caught this fish just chucked it onto the side. And there was just so much um, being caught by predators, they didn't actually know what to do with them. So just to make sure you, uh, you know, um, obviously didn't kill this to just take a picture of it. So the sparling, this is also known as the European smelt. And this is truly one of the most in incredible and gorgeous fish. Uh, it has this green sheen down its back and on its belly, it's sort of quite a, a pinky color and transparent. So you can see the organs inside it. Um, they are an anadromous species, which means that they live in the sea, but they spawn in fresh water. So earlier on, I said that I would talk about freshwater fish, sort of. This is sort of what I mean. Um, so this has a lifestyle that means it lives at sea, but it is essential for it to get into fresh water to spawn. Um, they do this around spring. And one great thing to tie again back into Luke's talk, she's really happy that he went first. Um, he was saying about daffodils um, or like signs of spring coming. And one of the ways to know that the sparling have arrived is that they arrive when the daffodils open. And I thought this was a lie. And I thought everyone in the town that I was working in was lying to me and they were making this up. So I'd look like a fool because I was waiting for these fish to arrive and I was waiting for this amazing event of spawning to happen. And they arrived when the daffodils open. And it's just this incredible, beautiful thing that um, nature is so intertwined. And uh, that was a slight diversion, but uh, the sparling. So this fish, uh, why I think it's so incredible is it lives at sea. It comes into fresh water. It spawns en masse over a couple of days and then it goes back out and you don't see it again. But over this time, there is an, a, a sort of an exodus of, uh, of fish into the area and back out again. And they spawn en masse. And if you can see on the right hand picture, these eggs going up all these reeds, and there is eggs absolutely everywhere, stuck to every surface. The water is bubbling with life. And there's thousands of these fish all, all over each other, just trying to spawn. And then a slight bit of rain or something comes and washes them back out and they're back at sea. And that's them complete. Um, an amazing bit of uh, a little fact of this species as well as the smell of cucumber. So this species 
you can tell when it's spawning, not only with the daffodil, but the fact that there is cucumber, fresh cut cucumber in the air. Again, I thought it was a lie and I thought they were having me on, but this was uh, my first position as an ecologist. Um, and my job was to try and make sure I was there the day that they spawned and track them coming into this area, uh, learn something uh, from the amount spawning over the time, and then also try and um, gauge when they were going to come in with different environmental factors. And I, it was, it was cucumber on the air, truly, absolutely incredible uh, little fish. And uh, what happens is they spawn, the eggs then um, take a, a fair amount of time to develop and hatch out, and they drift back out uh, to the ocean and live in a coastal sort of brackish area feeding on, on shrimp and other small invertebrates. Um, and this, this is just such a, a cool little fish. Uh, spread around uh, three locations in Scotland, and then all the rest of the UK has, has little, dist, uh, little pockets of them spread around as well. Um, and just a really cool thing, if you, um, if you would ever get the, the chance to be at near any of the rivers that have a population of these, truly incredible. Um, this was a little video, which I'm terrified that it won't play, but this is just a tiny bit of footage that I got of, this was uh, the day before they were actually leaving. Um, a little bit of rain came down, washed them all back out. And it's just so gorgeous to see them. Um, the... There is a little documentary as well that was made through um, the, the project that I was working on. Um, and I think it's just, I think it's just called The Sparling and you can find that online, but really, really cool. Absolutely gorgeous. You can't get the smell of cucumber, but I promise you it was there. Um, so the eel, as uh, I was introduced, yes, I am an eel specialist. Um, the most fascinating species that has ever, ever come across through reading, through working with a numerous different species, that having the pleasure of working with this animal is just uh, is something else. And these animals are sometimes uh, tricky to spot in the in the day, uh, but I have seen them um, in a little little burn um, and they're in ev they're in every bit of water. They will get absolutely everywhere uh, from really grubby sewage pipes to pristine rivers, fast flowing, deep uh, still pools, e absolutely everything. Any bit of wetland, the these things will get into it. And they have an incredible life cycle. And this is known as a, a catadromous species. Uh, so we had anadromous before, which meant living at sea and coming in and spawning in freshwater environment. But a, um, the uh, catadromous is the opposite way around. So they live in freshwater and go out to sea to spawn. Uh, so this is the, the life cycle of the eel. I'll quickly run through it anyway. Starting at the top, uh, this is an egg that starts in the Sargasso Sea. This is pretty much if you just go east from Florida out, you'll hit the Sargasso Sea a massive body of water about 4,000 kilometers from the UK. Uh, this is where this egg, egg, uh, egg starts. It hatches out and this is a pre-leptocephali and then it turns into this um, on the sort of the bottom right, a see-through willow shaped, willow leaf shaped creature that floats on the current back towards the continental shelf of Europe. And it'll hit the continental shelf and close to our rivers, but still in a uh, marine environment, as the glass eel, the very bottom one. And it will wait for the rivers to get to around about 10 degrees, and then it will move into fresh water. Uh, this is the sort of bottom left. This is when it becomes the elva. And this is just a, a pigmented form um, of, the, of the glass eel. So it gains a bit more pigment, pigment as it hits fresh water. And then it travels up and finds habitat that it can, uh, can live in and grow. This is the yellow eel phase, the far left. And this, this is an incredible and the longest um, longest life stage of the eel. And it can live up to decades and decades. The, the oldest one that I think was actually um, verified was in its late 80s. And there is one, there's, there's stories of these ancient eels living in wells for 110 years. But the one that was verified was into, uh, into its late 80s. This is incredible for, for a, a, a species, a fish species, to live that long in an environment. So that's the yellow eel, the far left. Just above that, um, sort of top left, is the silver eel. And this is the stage where it is getting ready to make the journey to the Sargasso Sea to complete the cycle to spawn. 
it it gains sort of a, a silver sheen on its belly, and it is it is really is metallic. It's one of the most glorious things you can see. Uh, its eyes grow huge in its head. Its whole morphology changes. Its fins change and widen for this big journey. Its muscle mass changes. Its digestive tract shuts down because it doesn't want to eat. It wants to get all of the energy into its reproductive organs and ready uh, for when it hits the Sargasso Sea and, and gets this huge aggregation to spawn. It makes this journey and then it dies. And no one has, has ever been able to actually say where the eel spawns in the Sargasso Sea, but um, there was... Um, there was an amazing, um, amazing uh, naturalist who uh, actually tracked the the small eels by doing circles um, in the in the from the wider reaches of the Atlantic Ocean all the way down, just constantly circling in smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller circles until he found a very small larval stage of the eel, and that's where they said well, they must be in the Sargasso Sea because the smallest form has been found closest to that point, but we've never known where they've actually actually spawned the location. So there's still a huge amount of mystery around this, this fish uh, and abs absolutely incredible. Um, I could talk forever on them, uh, but a few more to touch on. So uh, these are these mad fish all in the UK. Uh, the top left is a lamprey three different species of lamprey in the UK, uh, the brook, the river, and the sea lamprey. Uh, some are parasites that attach onto fish and actually parasitize them and use these hosts to gain their nutrients. Others eat algae off rocks, but they all um, have just incredible migrations to spawn. The brook lamprey um, stays within, within um, the, the freshwater environment, but um, is, is thought to migrate and spawn in that way. Uh, the other two use the sea um, to, to have um, uh, as part of their life stages to spawn. But these, these teeth help um, them latch onto either rocks to gain um, purchase and move through systems and feed, and also um, to become a parasite on fish and latch on and then slowly drill holes in. Uh, to the right of that, the stickleback, this humble little fish is one of the most incredible things to watch. If you're sat near a pond and there's some fish that look like they're bickering with each other, it's probably going to be a stickleback in spawning season. The males make their own nests. It's absolutely beautiful, tiny little structures in the water. And the male will guard these. And um, on this picture here that you can see as well, the male uh, has a really amazing sort of red throat down to um down to its belly as well and these are its spawning colors really like vivid gorgeous fish uh the bottom left that is an arctic char these live deep deep down in um the the locks of uh, of scotland and deep sea uh, and deep um deep regions of of uh, lakes uh, across the uk as well uh, a really rare species to see i've never seen one before but um this is a really really special one um and truly like, incredible um the grayling that's uh, another odd species that has this dorsal fin which is the fin on the back of the fish uh, and it has an amazing color on the top of it and a huge big sort of sail uh, on on its back and it looks like something that you'd find maybe in South America or something, but these, these are, are going through rivers which are pumped with pollution, which uh, run through the center of cities. And these absolutely incredible fish um, are, are just sat, sat in there, just, uh, just next to where we live and so underappreciated. Um, there's so many more I could, I could speak of, uh, everything from the brown trout to the salmon, but I've tried to stick to the, the odder, more obscure stuff here as well. Uh, unfortunately, it's not all uh, lovely fish and, and great sort of stories about them and uh, tales of their life histories. There's loads of things which affect fish. Um, one thing that is massively close to my heart is river barriers. And uh, the top left is actually a weir in, um, in Etherow Park, which is where near where I grew up in, uh, in Stockport. And uh, this this is seen as like one of the big attractions of the park and it's like the waterfall, um, but it's not, it's man-made. It's just a barrier on a river. And we see these structures on rivers and usually they have like a viewing platform next to them or they'll have a bridge or they'll have like little walkways to them. 
and they're seen as like these waterfalls, these really amazing structures on rivers. And they're, they're something that people walk to as part of their walk. And it's like a, um, the, the point in which that everyone looks at and takes a picture next to. But these structures are so damaging to our rivers. Mainly they were built around the Industrial Revolution to hold water back so it could be extracted to mills, either to power them or to extract water to be used in, in any form, really. Um, and some of them were for flood prevention before we had better ways to manage water. Uh, but a lot of them, for some reason, are still maintained and are still kept. And it is such a damaging structure to be on a river. It stops fish, which I've talked about in, in uh, earlier in the talk, from migrating either up into habitat which they need to survive and need to grow on for the rest of their life, uh, access to more resources. So the river has a higher holding potential or a carrying capacity, meaning that it can have more fish in it and support more. It limits them from moving up and gaining that. It also stops nutrients transferal from downstream to upstream, where fish, um, say a historic sort of example, the salmon, carries massive amounts of nutrients upstream into the headwaters. They then die in these environments and support the tree growth and the uh, flora in that environment by adding nutrients to areas which are quite nutrient poor. Uh, another uh, thing that is a, a massive uh, problem is pollution. And um, yeah, rivers, rivers are definitely getting uh, better or have got better since the industrial revolution but they're still not good enough sewage still pours into our rivers raw sewage um it people don't know that raw sewage enters our rivers on a near daily basis these are pumped into our rivers because um the the capacity of the sewage treatment plants isn't good enough and this means that raw sewage goes into our um into our uh, rivers into our lakes uh, eventually or or uh, ending up at the very end in the sea and we know all of the microplastics and pollution in the sea but a lot of this starts in our rivers and we should be tackling it there uh, overfishing is one um, where they can be over exploited or uh, they are seen as a resource and and hammered for this and it isn't done in a sustainable way that um that has just destroyed the stocks and this has been a huge problem. Um, and this still is a huge problem. Uh, bottom right is uh, a, a, another river barrier, but this is a reservoir at the top, holds loads of water for us and we need them, but the habitat is being restricted and changed and altered to only meet our needs and not meet the needs of the environment as well and the animals that uh, inhabit these areas. Uh, so some of the answers and what we can do. Top left is a solution to a river barrier. This is a rock ramp, one that I was so proud to be uh, working on as well. Uh, you can see some little, like almost lanes running down each side of it. And these are uh, low flow channels so that fish can get up in any condition. If the river is really low, they can still get above this uh, by swimming up these channels. But when the water is high, it flows over the rocks and creates a naturalized sort of cascade over them, creating more habitats and pools and pond areas and marshland. Uh, to the right, education. This is a group I work with, with the Prince's Trust. And um, this was just showing them what's in our rivers. And they had a true appreciation for what's in there after seeing it. And education is massively needed to get people to appreciate or to, to change. Uh, bottom right, tree planting. What can't be solved by planting a tree? Um, this is just fundamentals. Like getting more trees planted is so wonderful to do and practice. But it is so helpful. This is a riparian tree planting project. And what it does is it brings more biodiversity to the bank sides, but it also shelters our rivers, cooling them down. And with the temperature rising um, and climate change being uh, a huge issue and global warming affecting the oceans that we all know about, the freshwater environments massively suffer. But if we can have more shade given by trees, this means we cool down our rivers and we combat that. And we also sequester carbon in the air, and we've got more trees, great. Um, bottom left is uh, an eel rope. I had to get eels in there again. This is a rope that is made from straw and it's a natural uh, sort of process that you wind in like a helix-like structure and you drape it over a river barrier, a river barrier, so like a dam or a weir that I showed you before, and you drape this over it and eels use it to climb up because they, they climb when they get to these barriers, they don't swim. So they use this structure to climb up and it's just like a climbing frame for eels, which is just wonderful. Um, and 
how can we all get involved? Uh, this this is a, a definite plug for my project. Um, the Forgotten Fish project is is my project, and it all sort of focuses within uh, the stuff that I was talking about. Um, about getting people involved in this um, in a variety of ways, but teaching people what we have, what we've got to lose, and then also what we can do to, to change or to alleviate some of the issues uh, facing these incredible species. Um, there are river trusts all around the UK. You don't need to uh, you know, just come to the Forgotten Fish Project um, with the Fourth Rivers Trust, which is who I work with. There are river trusts all over the UK, all doing great work to try and preserve the natural, um, the natural environment, mainly focusing on freshwater ecosystems. But um, I hope a few of these, a few of these points uh, highlighted were interesting and um, I'd be, yeah, be really interested to see what you think and if you've got any questions. I'll pass back over to Sam. Oh, great. Thanks so much for that, Jack. That was uh, amazing, especially the eel who lived for over 80 years old. That's incredible. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if um, hopefully everyone here knows that uh, this webinar is part of Freedom for Animals Wildlife Month, which we're just coming to the end of that. And it's all about learning how. Uh, we can experience nature and experience the animals around us um, in a compassionate and an ethical way. Um, and there's been some great ideas in both uh, Luke and Jack's talk. Um, so as I said earlier, please put your uh, questions in the chat box uh, and we'll go on to ask our panel. Um, so there's a few questions in here. Um, Jack, there was one wanting to clarify you said that the eels can live up to 80 um but they die after spawning so do they only spawn once um yeah yeah sorry that was in my frantic rush to keep i've got a timer next to me in the frantic rush to meet 20 minutes uh, i skipped over probably a few things um yeah so they only they only spawn once and um they determine when they go out to spawning um by uh, a, a load of different methods really um some are environmental uh, some are sort of um resource dependent as well uh, but they only spawn once and um some will go out to spawn after um only a few years in in the uh, freshwater environment so in in southern parts of europe uh, they grow much much quicker because it's much warmer so uh they 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 go out to spawn a lot quicker but in scotland um, it is considerably colder and things take a lot longer. So, um, yeah, we, we usually see maybe about seven years for a male, which are quite small when they go out to spawn in comparison to a female, which is, is considerably larger. Um, and the females take usually about 14 years. So seven to 14 years, dependent on sex. Uh, but like I said, they can live for decades and decades and decades in a freshwater environment. Lovely. Thank you. Getting people saying thank you. Both talks were fascinating. And Luke, I think somebody said earlier that your photos were beautiful. Uh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, Luke, I wanted to ask, actually ask a question. Um, I was interested about the point where you were saying about walking through the city and seeing lots of faces and kind of maybe those things not standing out until you know that little bit more. Um, and I, it reminded me of um, an experience that I had, which I think we've, we've talked about previously, about when I was walking through the city centre and I was stopping and I was trying to figure out something and I heard birds singing, but it was like a, quite an animated, really chirpy sound. And, you know, I was next to a huge shopping centre and I looked up and there was like a little kind of, bog standard tree in, in a stand you know on the side of the street and there was a whole flock of goldfinches there and um I've only in the last few years become to know what goldfinch is to be aware of that kind of bird and they are again a really striking you know they're yellow they've got the red on their faces and um you know I, I was really struck by that moment of kind of people just busy 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 and and just above their heads was these like really beautiful birds um and you know obviously that's things like that are really kind of thoughtful for when you're working on 
stuff to do with zoos because I think people will pay for a day out to go to a zoo to be fascinated by kind of you know interesting looking animals yet you know right there was these birds that are probably like myself even though I'm you know an animal person don't even realize are, are there and um yeah I just wanted to sort of come back to that point that you made because I think that's really relevant yeah yeah I think it's I think it's one of those things and Jack touched on it really well as well with the talk um, when he was talking about fish is that sort of understanding of what's on our doorstep I think a lot of people sort of associate or can associate nature with the representations of it that we see so for example in this day and age a lot of that is around um you know um wildlife documentaries and a focus on sort of international travel globalization where we're interested in the exotic the rare the valuable the really far away the absolutely crazy stuff and as a result of that we sort of lose a little bit of our awareness of, of what's sort of around um i think the goldfinches you use as an example are a really nice um example i remember last year in the in the middle of um, lockdown when the traffic had gone out of the city I um, as part of the part of my exercise I went for a bike ride down um, Deansgate just to see it because I was hearing stories from my friends who live in the city centre of saying you know it's just it's just totally quiet there's n there's nothing happening and so I cycled down Deansgate you know I, I could see from one side of the street to the other there wasn't a single car there wasn't a single person and all I could hear was goldfinches in the trees singing. And there was just a moment of realization when I thought, oh, hang on a minute, you're not in a park, you're not in a woodland, this is actually Deansgate. And you know, you've got, you know, you've got birdsong. Um, mm. And so I think it's, it's, it's sort of one of those things where we just need to sort of maybe have, you know, we need to make that conversation a little bit more public really about you know the the kinds of things that we have on our doorstep the value of them but also that there's something for everyone to access i really like jack's point as well earlier about he's talking about um the freshwater species you know how we can just access them they're here they're there for us to go and appreciate and look at and spend time with you know it's not nature isn't always about getting in the car on the weekend and driving somewhere this far away you know that isn't that isn't what nature has to be. It can also be something that is fundamentally a part of your everyday life and your, your walk to work, for example, or your commute, looking out and noticing these different things that are around us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, um, if you, everyone wants to shoot any more questions over, I um, can't see very many others at the moment. Um, another point that I really wanted to um, make with this talk was about the sort of um, the fascination and the kind of extra specialness of seeing an animal in the wild, which is where they're supposed to be. And one of the points that we make in our campaigns is with zoos is, you know, people are seeing animals in an artificial environment they're not going to get a true representation of how that animal would behave um, and interact with the world because the where they're being kept is, is so unnatural and they don't have those opportunities. They're probably not meeting other individuals in the way that they would in the wild. So when um, you're out and about or you're, you know, maybe actively seeking um, out to spot wildlife, it has an extra specialness because it's not a guarantee, you know, it's your, it's an encounter and you're not just paying for that, that you're just going to stand in front of a cage and, and sort of see this kind of false representation of, of what those animals could be like. Um, you know, I've got many experiences where I've just happened to spot a particular animal. And at the moment I have a wren making a nest on my balcony and I live in the city center and it's just, one of the best things that's ever happened to me because I it's so close and I can see them making this little nest and getting on with their lives and I've now learned a lot more about wrens than I'd ever known before um so again I think Jack and Luke both of what you've said and, and those kinds of experiences you know I'd be interested um Jack when you're saying about you work with these different groups what kind of responses you might get from people who maybe haven't you know thought about fish before in that way as being fascinating and interesting 
Yeah, I think um, I think you, you do get a mixed result at the at the, at the start, and um, I've been yeah, I've, I've had some people who have been really engaged and um, and active and sort of wanting to to get involved. But I think it's more interesting to to work with people who um, who haven't had that and who don't really um, see themselves as a, an animal person, as, as you put it before. And I think that's um, they're a really cool uh, group of people to work with because everything's new and everything's exciting as well. So it's so easy to get people engaged and excited about things because they've almost been detached from it. And uh, I work with a, a community um, that was next to the River Leven. And the River Leven um, is one of the coolest rivers because this uh, uh, eels, um, because there's loads and loads of eels in it. They used to be, um, they used to have all the way, uh, access all the way up to Loch Leven, which had a massive amount of eels in. Um, and it's historically in all these different books from like 1820s, it has, uh, they, they mention how many eels were there. And there's this really, really, really cool river, but it is, um, it's been absolutely hammered by uh, industry. It's, it was um, from a certain point down, it was actually, um, it was actually sort of uh, recorded as a dead river from a point down because there was a huge amount of pollution that went in over a short period of time that killed the entire river from the, the source of that pollution all the way down. But it's recovered um, and there's barriers on there which have broken down over the years and now it's just rubble and habitat in the river. And those, the, the people who I was working with there, the communities, didn't know about any of this and we were showing them the, the the fish that were in the river and it was just so interesting to hear the questions and and get some of the feedback from it as well and and just hear how it was you know completely eye-opening because it's underneath the surface it's it's something that's quite hidden to you unless you're looking and the second you open your eyes there is just infinite possibilities it just never stops and what uh, a point you made before as well about the the fact that seeing an animal in the wild it is so much more more special because it's completely real it, it really is like it's the um it's the ultimate animal you know it is exactly what it wants to be it's great and you see all these behaviors that you don't you can't even understand half the time as an ecologist i sometimes look at fish and just they blow my mind i have no idea what they're doing um but it's so interesting and it's so nice um so I think, I think, yeah, getting people involved from, you know, people who are animal people to people who have nothing to do with it will find it interesting if they're just given the chance and opportunity to do it, um, which is something that's massively missing within the curriculum currently. Um, and yeah, all my passion came from documentaries um, and just sitting next to my pond in my garden. That That is enough to completely blow your mind and get you hooked forever. So um it's very easy to get these people engaged. Great. Awesome. Um, just, uh, just, if, I, if I can just add on to what Jack's just said there as well. Um, I, um, I see seen a question come in the chat actually about improving public awareness um, from Jasmine. And I think it's a really important point. Um, I know that, well, I think the, one of the things that zoos do from an experiential point um, amongst many other things is that you turn up and the animal's there and it sort of cultivates this expect, expectation of you, you turn up to somewhere and the animal's there and, and it performs and then you go home. And so when you try and transfer that set of experiences to taking someone to a woodland or a pond or, or, a, or a meadow or whatever it might be and say, okay, now you've, maybe got to wait like three hours and it might not turn up at all, but come back next week and you might have another chance. You know, all of a sudden people's interest levels can potentially, you know, nosedive because that those set of experiences that they've, they've sort of cultivated around engaging and seeing animals is completely, um, completely misplaced and sort of inauthentic really. So I think that's, that's one of the challenges. And I've sort of got an extreme example in Salford of someone um, with a, a little bit of a disconnection towards her local space. So I, I, I did some work with a community group called the Broughton Trust um, for a number of years in Salford. And one day we were talking to this lady who'd been living in Lower Broughton for about five years. And she was living in a row of sort of classic Manchester terraces. Um, and her house was sort of two streets away from the river. 
um, very, very close. So just kind of behind a house, but like a couple of rows of terraces were, were in the way. Um, and it sounds bonkers, but she didn't know the river was there because she was a single mom. She had many other priorities and many other responsibilities in her life. And most days she would just get up, walk out the house to the bus stop, go into town, come back, deal, pick up the kids, deal with the kids, go to bed, do it again. Um, and she had no idea because she'd never had the time to come out of her house and go the other way. Um, and I just think, you know, even though that feels like an extreme example, sort of, I think it, it, it also sort of um, reflects maybe some of the, the, the wider challenges we have around giving ourselves the time to explore and be curious and wonder and pay attention and look around and see sort of what is on our doorstep, really. And uh, so I guess slightly following on from that, I, this one for you, Luke, and perhaps uh, Jack, if you want to come in as well. I wonder if you've got any, you, well, sorry, you spoke quite a bit about like plastic pollution uh, and other kind of litter problems within these habitats. And I wonder if you had any tips for kind of the lay, the lay person, if they wanted to get involved in, in these kind of conservation efforts in their local areas, how they'd go about that and how they'd kind of get involved within maintaining these habitats in their, in their local areas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely an issue that can feel overwhelming, I think, when you start looking into it and seeing the numbers and the scale of it. For me, what I ended up doing was I set up, um, I set up a voluntary project in Salford called Nature in Salford, which I ran for like four or five years. And every week we'd run free nature based events with the local community, whether it be schools or just members of the public. And we do wildlife walks, we do litter picks, we do educational walks around the area to try and cultivate a sense of ownership and pride um, and awareness about the issues. Um, and there's loads of really cool organizations that do that on a national scale. So I think maybe um, the Marine Conservation Society and Surface Against Sewage are probably two of the bigger ones. But then there's also a lot of local campaign groups that run things or local community groups that run these things as well. I always recommend just getting involved in that because not only does it feel good to do good stuff, but also surrounding ourselves with people who, you know, share concern for these kind of issues mm -hmm. is not only good because it's strength in numbers and we can get more good stuff done, but it's also important to look after ourselves in these times, you know, like things are stressful enough. Life can be stressful enough when you start getting into conservation and environmentalism. You're like, why am I adding all this other stuff on top of mm -hmm. like, <laughs> life, you know, life in the first place? So I think it, it's really important to find those people and get that community um, um, sort of around you as well. Um, and the other point I was going to say was um, around personal behaviour and choice, really sort of, you know, thinking about what you buy, voting with your money, which I know is a concept we're becoming more and more familiar with now as we sort of um, try and encourage um, mass producers to sort of change their ways and just be a little bit more mindful about sort of... Um, what things we're supporting with the money that we spend yeah great. yeah yeah i mean I, yeah like definitely agree with everything um luke said um but like add a few maybe uh, little bits anyway um that just on a, a purely sort of um very very easy um easy thing to do um for everyone is uh i said i mentioned that sewage goes into our rivers um and sort of following the the whole three P's, like pee, poo, and paper. Just put them down the toilet and nothing else. Uh, like you wouldn't believe the terrible things I find in rivers <laughs> um, just that comes through the toilets. It's awful. But, um, you know, that that's a super simple, really nice, easy thing to um, for, for people to do. And I can, I, I'm probably thinking uh, if people are, um, you know, conservation-minded, animal-minded, that's a, probably quite a normal thing for everyone um, who, who's probably listening to this talk. But little things like that are definitely um, a, a major, major issue. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, I, I guess being outside and noticing um, what we've got and then also um, with the, the river barriers, you know, the fact that people think that they're really... Um, the the uh, nice waterfall or something i guess um work can be done to to uh, save a lot of these environments or to improve them but it takes the public engagement 
as a fundamental uh, sort of starting point to, to get these projects going. Um, if no one cares and no one shouts about it or no one discusses it, then it's just it just gets overlooked and it really does. And the main way that we get, say, a lot of our, our fish passes, which is um, a way of getting a fish above a barrier, um, just by either putting a ramp up there or I, I explained before, like a rock ramp by making it look like a, um, an, a sort of a broken up section of river by building something onto these river barriers. Um, and it allows fish to move freely through through the rivers as they should be able to. Um, but they're, 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 they're again public driven. If people aren't bothered about it and don't shout about it or don't recognize it as a problem, um then that is that's that's really the the building blocks of it so yeah making your voice heard um um you know contacting people and discussing these things is really where we start with everything and it, it goes from there and, and snowball effect yes i think um something that's running from my mind is again just a comment really about um zoos and obviously their conservation arguments and um you know that they say that that's obviously one of the main reasons that they exist despite the fact that the research that we've carried out shows that the vast majority of animals in zoos aren't endangered and very 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 few ever make it out of the zoos back into the wild so those claims you know are obviously um yeah inflated by the zoo industry as, as one of their justifications for existence but i am um, also an interesting um thing is that whether there's something with people going to zoos and being told that this is their conservation contribution in a way by giving money to a zoo um, you know the zoo's telling them they're doing something good for nature and animals whereas there's projects or need for projects like you both mentioned that probably struggles to get funding I would imagine you know and I, you know I think just from knowing the kinds of things that you, you particularly we've talked about recently Jack is you know trying to get funding from some sort of trust or some body to be able to put on a session with local people or be able to build a barrier or whatever it might be um, and it just again, just when we think about the millions of pounds that go into zoos, um, which we would say are having a very minimal impact on conservation, whereas the things that you're both talking about, the education, the awareness raising being so crucial um, and the practical elements of that as well, you know, not getting that funding, that's just another kind of frustrating aspect of, of there being zoos in the kind of business sense that they are now. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's um, there's there's definite um, there's definite focuses in some of the wrong areas. So uh, definitely, um, and I guess I guess a lot of this as well. Um, I guess one of the issues that I have is the fact that the unfair bias um, to particular species as well um, that mm -hmm. get much more funding um, because they're raised as these you know flagship species that everyone loves and loves to see and they're really iconic and um, I think all the stuff that we've been talking about in this talk is the fact that we have amazing native wildlife here that people can appreciate on their doorstep and it's wild it's free it's you know it, it is um, exactly how how it should be seen um, and and there isn't enough focus, not even close to enough focus on what we have in um, across across the UK um, on what we have here and how to protect it. And I think that's such a shame um, seeing some of these larger scale projects and conservation efforts that do go and do do some uh, do, do some great good on on bigger species. But um, the fact is, the the distribution of money in conservation is usually swayed to the public's perception of it and their love for the animal. So I think we need to start by rebuilding people's appreciation of what is nature and the animals we need to start to protect. Um, because usually the less attractive, lower down the food chain, the more important they are there. You're starting from these building block um, organisms and working your way up. Uh, and yeah, there isn't an animal that isn't important, but there's ones which really should be focused on and are just getting forgotten. And it's, it's really sad to see. Yeah. Okay, well, we've reached 8.30. So I just wondered if there was any final questions or if either 
Jack, Luke, or Sam wanted to make any final comments? No, I just wanted to once again thank uh, both Jack and Luke for, for speaking today. They were really inspiring and like educational talks. I found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I hope that uh, it's kind of inspired everyone to, to kind of get out and really engage with nature, you know, in a much more um, kind of meaningful and, and compassionate way. You know, I've definitely been inspired myself from this evening's talks. Um, and I think one uh, other thing to quickly mention is as we're sadly, um, even though lockdown restrictions have slightly eased, um, we're still in some form of restrictions this week, this weekend, which is Zoo Awareness Weekend, the Easter weekend. Um, and we'll be launching a brand new invest investigation into the zoo industry sometime this week. So do keep an eye open for that and for actions for you to take uh, over the Easter weekend. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you very much to Jack and Luke. It was really interesting and it is, um, we're getting loads of nice comments saying thank you. And it is just really great to speak, hear people speak when they're really passionate and they just love, you know, their topic and the wildlife that you um, work for and work with all the time. So yeah, it was really great. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are going to, sorry, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say thank you, it was a lot of fun. Good. I'm glad. We've got a lot about butterflies and eels, which I'm sure you've both uh, really enjoyed. We have got another webinar coming up at the on the 30th of April, which we'll start promoting next week, and that is going to be about the primate pet trade. And we'll be speaking with someone from um, a monkey sanctuary in Cornwall. So um, yeah, hopefully you can also join us on that one as well. But yes, other than that. Great stuff. Thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye.